So that's good to know. You can always add an organizer after the system. I'm going to run through some examples with you know, the other technology and building content for that. Right? So now I'll come in here and uh, I'll make sure she turned her own mic off too. There we go, we're going to start. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar on Open Studio Overview. We're going to spend uh, the next hour of this afternoon talking about how Open Studio might be used in the context of a workflow that will be supported by NYSERDA PON 1601, which is the, is the NYSERDA New Construction Program. And my name is Chris Balbach. I'm the Vice President of Research and Development at Performance Systems Development. I'll be leading your webinar today. I'm a professional engineer in the state of New York, a CEM, a CMVP, and I'm also the chair of the VISA certification course that's offered by AEE. So with today's webinar, I have to, uh, because of the attendees and the uh, amount of material I'd like to cover in the next hour, I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody. But what I'd like you to do, if you can, is if you have questions that come up during the next hour, if you could go ahead and enter those questions in the, and into the questions pane at the bottom right of the uh, GoToMeeting interface. And if we have time at the end, we'll go through some key questions and answers and, and address the, those questions. The webinar today is going to be a mixture of slides. We're going to go through about 35 slides and also real-time demonstrations. We're going to walk through a, a pre-built building uh, that's been built up to a certain point. We'll walk it through the nice sort of PON 1601 workflow and use Open Studio to evaluate some uh, incentive options for that building. So I, I would encourage you as much as possible to make this interactive. And again, if there are questions, please Please go ahead and ask them in the webinar pane. So our agenda for this next 55 minutes or so, we'll start off by just a brief introduction to the Open Studio ecosystem, just introducing the suite of tools. But then we'll move on and we'll introduce uh, PON 1601, which hopefully most of you are familiar with, but we'll focus in on the incentive structure that's associated with PON 1601. And then we'll jump into an example. I'll introduce a simple building. It's just a 2,300 square foot uh, commercial sort of recreation center. And we will walk through the steps of driving that building through the PON 1601 uh, process. Those steps would be to build a baseline model. Uh, we'll attribute the model very quickly uh, using the SketchUp plugin for Open Studio. We'll assign some compliance properties for ASHRAE 90.1-2007 uh, Appendix G, uh, again using the SketchUp plugin. 
We'll rapidly create Appendix G baseline HVAC systems uh, using the OS application tool. We'll create some Appendix G baseline service hot water uh, generation and schedules and usage levels as well. And then we'll refine some areas of the model. We'll do those using the OS application. And then we'll add some measures to our model. We'll use a separate application called the Open Studio Parametric Analysis Tool to evaluate some alternatives uh, against our compliant base model. And again, always keeping in mind NYSERDA's uh, PON 1601 program requirements. And then finally, we'll just evaluate the results of our, our measures. And at the end, we'll touch again on some uh, upcoming opportunities that NYSERDA has co-funding uh, opportunities for training on Open Studio and then the tools that we're going to see over the next hour. So just to start at a very high level here, 30,000 feet, what are we talking about here? Really, we're talking about a new innovation software a suite or tool set of, of programs, and it's called Open Studio. This slide really shows the, the history of, of energy simulation in our country. And the slide starts in with the mid-60s and stops at the, at, in the 80s. But to be honest with you, things really haven't changed that much uh, since the 80s, and here we are in, in 2014. I'll just point out that um, our industry, us uh, as energy modeling professionals, we really are using a lot of technology that was uh, built up and st was started in, in the mid-70s and the 80s. And Open Studio represents a change to that. It really represents a technological leap. And, uh, and of what I would call innovation. And I just want to set the stage here of why we would even care about this. And there's really three reasons. Uh, we want to differentiate our offerings as service providers. We want to outcompete our competitors who are also providing those services. And third, we want to enter new markets. And we really want to wrap all three of those in, into simulation services, new offerings for simulation services that are essentially better, cheaper, or faster. The link at the bottom of this slide is a great uh, dissertation. It was a friend of mine, a good, dear friend of mine, Dr. Jeff, Jeff Haberl, one of his students. And you can, again, check out that link. It's basically a, a history of energy simulation since the mid-60s up to about uh, 2012. And you'll see they, they start to mention Open Studio, but where we're at now is very different. So where we're at now, the next slide here, is what we would call DOE's energy modeling ecosystem. And I, you'll see the graphic on the top left, which is essentially a spoke arrangement where your open studio is at the hub of the spoke. We're going to be working today with some applications that use open studio. They're here at the, at the right, sort of bottom right of this. We'll be working with PAT, the open studio application, the SketchUp plugin, and the PAT spreadsheet perhaps, and perhaps the open studio server if time permits. These are all again linked to the open studio software development kit. And the difference with the Open Studio as opposed to some of the other uh, efforts that DOE has really invested over the years into energy modeling is that uh, Open Studio is number one, it's open source. Number two, it's cross-platform. It will run on Macs, Linux boxes, Windows boxes. The same file can be shared across different uh, platforms. And the third difference here, a big one, is it's collaborative. We have a lot of different uh, agencies, universities, private sector folks who are developing this suite of tools and systems that use Open Studio, and that's what you see here on the rest of the spoke. Some of these applications, uh, like the DOE Asset Score, are being developed by the federal government. Simulat being developed by private sector. Others being developed by private sector. All of this again sits on top of the Open Studio SDK, and that really is is a, a pathway for us to provide innovation with energy modeling services. I can't really get into this today too much. But there are two other pieces that we will touch on, uh, the Technology Performance Exchange and the Building Component Library. That really, if you see here again, they provide raw data into this modeling ecosystem. So we'll see this when we do some of our examples uh, later in the hour, how the Building Component Library integrates with Open Studio. So what's different about Open Studio? Why is it uh, really any better than any other modeling engine that may be out there? Uh, number one, it's it's really it's an interface, an overlay, a middleware, some would call it, for a state-of-the-art simulation engine, and that engine is Energy Plus. And that engine allows us to model at sub-hourly simulation time steps, 15 minute, 10 minute, 6 minute. We really need those time steps if we're going to start to look at things like daylighting in a serious way. Uh, in addition, Energy Plus allows us to model uh, simultaneous plant loop and air loop solutions. That's a fancy word for saying it. Around, it allows us to get beyond this problem we've had for years, which is 
some engines will call it unmet hours. When we size systems and they don't meet the load, that's called an unmet hour. And in Energy Plus, we would get feedback on that, not just that the system was too small to meet the load, but actually that the temperature, the set point in the room drifted during that hour of unmet load. That's really important feedback for sizing and selecting systems. The second differentiator I would say that Open Studio offers is, is an ability to model innovative HVAC systems. And I'm talking about things like radiant cooling systems, VRF, ground source heat pumps that are linked to directly to the ground or directly to cooling towers or directly to building mass, as well as chilled beams. And while these there are other engines that can model these technologies, they, and, and Energy Plus, and it's the engine we'll be talking about here, we're modeling these technologies much more directly. So less workarounds, if you will. Uh, the third innovation, powerful capabilities for modeling the interactions of natural and artificial light, and that's, that's through a linkage to the radiance a simulation engine, which Open Studio provides the same object model, the same set of descriptions for your surfaces and walls and punched openings and so forth and your fenestration properties. will drive your thermal model as, and they also drive the radiance of the daylight engine model. Uh, the fourth uh, differentiator I point out here is that Open Studio is linked to crowdsource content, and that would be the building component library, which is an emerging source of data both for components and for measures, easy ways to manipulate your model that you're leveraging the crowd to, uh, to acquire this technology. And the last, the last uh, differentiator I put on this slide is that Open Studio provides an extensible framework. And by that I really mean that it's easy to automate. It's very easy to automate processes of Open Studio through what we call Open Studio measures. It's also very easy to develop your own custom input or custom output reports and further to develop your own quality assurance procedures. So this is really a, a different beast we're talking about here. Open Studio represents a pathway in my mind where innovation can occur. And that pathway, uh, even a few years ago, say a year and a half, two years ago, just simply didn't exist with the other engines that are common in the marketplace. So let's go talk about and I sort of Pond 1601 to set a bit of a, a baseline for this. Now, when we talk about Pond 1601, we've got really three paths that a project can take. We're going to focus today on the whole building design incentive path because that is the only path that requires energy simulation in order to access the incentives. The other two paths, pre-qualified measures and custom measures, we're not going to talk about today. Again, we'll focus on the whole building design incentive path. So within that path, the whole building design incentive path, there are design team incentives and there are owner facing incentives. And here are this slide we're looking at the design team incentives in detail. So let's just take a moment and look at these. There are uh, some constraints for the peak, you know, the ceilings, if you will, for these incentives. And at the bottom, you'll see uh, some tiered levels uh, where there's a percentage band and then an incentive amount, again, for the design team, which is based on peak KW reduction. So the metric here is energy cost savings over a baseline model that's adherent to 90.1-2007, Appendix G. And again, from the design team's uh, perspective, uh, we would get paid um, based on the peak demand KW we save over a adherent baseline model. So that's, that's sort of how that works. And I threw a link in here again where there's a free download for 90.1-2007 for those of you who want to get into the details of that. Uh, there are also owner-facing incentives for NYSERDA uh, Pond 1601. This is where the real money is. And uh, the 1601 program is it branches uh, depending on where the building is located, uh, whether it's in Con Ed or outside of the Con Ed service territory. And then furthermore, it branches again with some ceilings for the incentive levels and then a similar tier uh, based on percentage cost savings over a baseline building, 90.1 Appendix G 2007. But the incentives you see here uh, are on a cents per kilowatt hour saved. And of course, if you go deeper, say we call it like a deeper retrofit or a deeper building, then you would get a deeper level of, of uh, cents per kilowatt hour saved as well. So the max here for a building, say where I'm at in Ithaca, New York, would be uh, 16 cents per kilowatt hour saved. And that would be for a building that saves a minimum of 30% over the 90.1-2007 Appendix G baseline. So. That's important to understand because we, our goal here really is to maximize the incentives 
for our owner. We want to get the, the best building we can to them. We want to drive technology into the, the building itself, and we're going to leverage simulation tools to do that. So let's talk about our example building that we're going to use for the rest of this uh, webinar. It's a simple building, and I, I understand it's a small building. We probably wouldn't necessarily use this building in, in a, real a real application. This probably would go toward a pre-qualified or um, pre, you know, basically a deemed program. But we're going to see if this could actually be done through the whole building design path. And again, for that to be possible, we'd have to be able to do it very quickly, better, faster, and cheaper. So we'll, we'll, that will be our goal, to demonstrate how easily it, it can be to, to generate a baseline building in 90.1-2007 Appendix G adherent building uh, using the Open Studio ecosystem of tools. And then to, again, a look at scenarios for optimizing the incentives for our owner. So this building is a recreation center. I, it's a shot off the uh, cover drawing right there, a title sheet. You'll see it's a fairly small building. Uh, actually, the next slide is a floor plan of the building. I'll just go over that real quick before we go too much further. There's an entrance at the bottom, uh, sort of the south face of the building. To the right, there are two large uh, classrooms with a divider between them. Uh, there's an entrance corridor. To the left of the corridor are two smaller classrooms, some, some restroom areas above the smaller classrooms. Uh, some mechanical areas here in the back, a boiler room and an electrical switchgear room. Then in the center core here, we have a mixture of some break rooms, some uh, private office toward the bottom, another private office restroom, some storage areas, and just some pass-through vestibules to go from the corridor into the multi-purpose rooms. So all this stuff, again, we're assuming that we have for a project. This is sort of SD level. Uh, information that we would have for any sort of building going through Pond 1601, some sort of uh, plan of the building's layout. So our first step here would be to bring this plan into SketchUp, and we really, literally would bring it in and we'd sketch right over the top of it using the SketchUp drawing tools. And uh, that's what you'll see here. I've just, again, using the free SketchUp um, Open Studio plugin, we've created just a single line drawing of each floor in the building. Now this happens to be a single floor, a single story building, so it's very simple. And we would attribute this by just breaking these, this building up into individual, what we call spaces. So a space diagram of the building. And I'm not sure if you can read that again, but we've broken this down to the detail of vestibules, restrooms, activity rooms, multi-purpose rooms, offices, uh, and so on and so forth. It's important to, to note that these are not thermal zones. So we can actually break these uh, single line drawings up into a fair level of detail because later we will group these together into thermal zones. And so the next thing we'll do after we create this single line drawing on a floor by floor basis would be to go ahead and extrude it. And that's again a very simple, uh, it's one button essentially, to extrude our floor plan up uh, to create three dimensional open studio spaces similar to what we see here in the image at the center of the slide. We would then run a few commands and intersect and divide. And I'll, again, we'll go through this uh, live with the Open Studio SketchUp plugin in a few moments. Uh, but we would run a few Open Studio commands here to make sure we understand the adjacency of these surfaces, that the Open Studio model correctly understands the adjacency of interior walls, for example. After that, we would very simply sketch on top of the uh, three-dimensional spaces that we've created within SketchUp. You'll see here I've um, sketched windows, which are essentially punched openings into this building. I've uh, basic again, just following the dimensions that were on the schematic design uh, drawings. And this model also has uh, another feature here. I've added in external shades. You'll see the deep purple. Those are represented to be shading surfaces. So we're getting those into our model again. We're getting openings such as walls, um, windows, and doors. And um, adding shading objects as necessary. Here again, we would also add adjacent buildings and things like that if they were appropriate for shading objects. We're doing all of that again through the SketchUp plugin interface. And after, once we're finished sketching in our punched openings and our shading surfaces, we would just, again, using the SketchUp plugin, do some simple checks, some simple cuts, if you will, to look through the building and make sure that we've, we are representing what we intend to represent. So, for example, here we're looking at a boundary condition of the interior partition walls of this model, and the green color on this boundary condition would tell me that 
the Open Studio plugin believes these green walls to be interior walls and not exterior walls. So we're just again confirming the geometric relationships of what we had just created. Very simple here again to do that. Our next step in this process is going to involve something new that if you haven't used Open Studio before, uh, it'll be completely new to you. And that would be the application of an Open Studio object called a resource object, and a particularly a resource object called a space type. So Open Studio offers us a number of objects, there, again, resource objects that can be essentially applied in many different places at one time. So think of them as meta sets. And these are objects like construction sets, schedule sets, load definitions, and a very important one called space types. Open Studio ships with a library of space type resource objects that are filtered by three different dimensions. One is the principal activity of the space type. The second is a vintage or an age and the third would be a climate zone. And this is really important because when we start to attribute a model, say for example to 90.1-2007 Appendix G compliance properties, we're going to do that by applying a space type. And that's, that's a very simple uh, command to do. And what will happen is in the swoop of a command, we will very quickly apply properties throughout the entire space. It will associate with the defined properties of the space type. So this concept of a resource resource object and a particular resource object called a space type and the ability to very quickly assign properties to spaces and to think of a space as literally a collection of walls, roof, floor, you know, literal physical objects. We're going to assign properties to them by assigning a space type to the space. That's a really powerful feature not only for applying 90.1-2007 um, compliance uh, attributes to objects, but also applying uh, firm-specific design standards. Say your own, whatever uh, your firm uses, if they use a particular construction style or wall construction, or whatever it might be, you can very rapidly apply that to your model using the Open Studio space type resource. So again, what we would do is, using the SketchUp plugin, we would attribute the building and really the spaces that are inside this building, the spaces that we, the single line space drawing we had a few uh, slides ago, with compliance objects. So compliance default construction sets, compliance schedules, and they would all be in compliance with ASHRAE 90.1-2007. So here you'll see again in this particular slide, I'm looking at the building on the left. I've chosen the building as, a, as the object I'm acting on. And that building has a default construction set, which is 90.1-2007 Climate Zone 4 Office. And Open Studio has a very powerful inheritance model, where the building sits at the top of the, of the inheritance, and then underneath this would be uh, spaces. It's like a tree, if you will. So if I, I basically right here define my construction set for that entire building to be this set. And on the right, you can see I've, again, using the SketchUp plugin, what's called the Open Studio Inspector tool of the plugin. What's in this construction set? Well, there are default construction surface names, default interior partition wall construction names, there are default um, interior partition constructions, on and on and on. This is a meta object, again, to, to very rapidly attribute properties to a building. So we'll do that, and we'll attribute to 90.1-2007. And we'll do that again within the SketchUp plugin. You'll see here there is a, a widget for doing this where one would select the spaces that are in their model. And I have highlighted the two big multipurpose rooms in this screenshot. And I said assign them a space type of 90.1-2007 office slash conference. And by doing that, I'm, I'm assigning schedules. I'm assigning equipment loads, lighting loads, equipment schedules, lighting schedules that are compliant adherent to 90.1-2007 um, office conference subtype. So that's very, very powerful use of a meta object. The other thing I'm doing when I'm doing this is I'm also assigning a number of what we would call uh, non-regulated loads. So there's a number of things in Appendix G that aren't called out. For example, people density. Occupant density is not, is not specified in Appendix G. When I assign this space type, I am assigning a default occupant density to these spaces. And of course, I can go in later and I can change them. But it will, it will be a, a reasonable 
people density, say seven people per thousand square foot for an office. It's been coded into this object uh, titled space type for an office. So essentially what I've done here is I, I have, or we have at our access, these space types, these resource objects that are adherent to 90.1-2007 where maybe with some other tools where you've used, you look up the, uh, here's a screenshot of 90.1-2007's table 5.5.4, you say, okay, I've got a non-residential building, I've got a wall above grade, it's a mass wall, I need to build something that meets this U value uh, for my assembly for my baseline wall construction. And that's the way we might do this in some other simulation tools. We would go and construct that. If we go uh, look inside the space type resource object for a non-residential, say an office, 90.1-2007, we would see something like this. And it's already coded in for us. It's already, it's already been created. So this is a huge time saver in terms of you know, you may never look at this again. The tables in Appendix G, they've all been coded into Open Studio objects for your ease of use, for your ease of attribution to physical walls and uh, windows and doors and roofs and floors and so forth. Over here on the left, I have a column, uh, the, the column to the left, which is a description of all the resources that come in when you bring in what's called an Open Studio template. And I'll show this to you again in a few minutes. but. These templates are arranged by a building type. So for example, there's a template for hotels, there's another template for office, small office, medium office, large office, there's a template for hospitals, there's a template for restaurants, template for retail. And when one brings in these templates, imports these templates into their Open Studio model, they bring in a great deal of information, including all of these objects. So people definitions, people schedules, lights, light definitions, and so forth. All of that comes in ready to use. It's a huge time saver for rapidly uh, attributing a model. So our next step in this model generation is to take our spaces, our literal uh, three-dimensional physical walls and windows and so forth, and assign space types to them. And this is just a plan view of the space types I assigned to this building. I know it's a little fuzzy to see. But I assigned a classroom to this bottom right uh, classroom. I assigned an office conference areas to these top two uh, large multi-purpose rooms. It's, that's a 90.1-2007 closed office area to this private office. I'm attributing, again, compliance uh, objects to these space types. And again, to, to drive home the point, I'm not just attributing the compliance uh, pieces of this, but also many, many, many unregulated loads. The next step in building a, a model for um, Upon 1601, new construction would be to group our spaces, which have been attributed by space type, group them into thermal zones. I'm doing all this again within the SketchUp plugin, and you can see a plan view here where I have grouped together my spaces into four thermal zones. I have three active thermal zones, one for each of the multipurpose rooms, one for the combined classrooms and restrooms and private office and lobby. And then a fourth thermal zone here, which is an unconditioned zone. It's our mechanical space and our switch gear room and uh, storage areas that are unconditioned. Very simple to do. I just simply select these uh, spaces, and, and there's a command for assigning them to a common thermal zone. The next step on this, I'm still in the SketchUp plugin, is just to inspect what I've created to make sure, again, that I've my model has uh, the proper number of spaces, the proper number of doors and windows and so forth. And within the uh, SketchUp plugin, there is a tool called the Open Studio Inspector, which can be used to edit individual objects. So I may have uh, assigned some, you know, for example, I've assigned the people density for that, that office uh, slash conference room. And it may have come in at seven people per thousand square foot. I can certainly go in here and change that to three or six or 12 or whatever on an individual basis. And I can do that in the Open Studio uh, Object Model Inspector. So that's about as far as I can go with this tool, which is the SketchUp plugin. And we're going to migrate to another tool here, which is called the Open Studio Application. And the Open Studio Application is a very interesting tool. And it's, it's most interesting to me because it uses what are called measures. And this, again, is another new term which may not be familiar. Uh, we may have Think of a measure as an ECM or a, you know lots of terms for a measure, but in, 
in open studio language, when we say a measure, what we mean is it's a lot it's a collection of logic which uh, describes how to transform an energy model easily and consistently and repeatedly, in other words. It's essentially a macro. And I know many of you have probably written visual basic macros to automate pieces and parts of, of various Excel spreadsheets. Think of a measure as an automated macro for modifying an open studio model. And it's really it's a very powerful feature. As many of you who are Excel gurus know, uh, the ability to, to write your own macro to automate repetitive tasks extremely productive. The same kind of productivity can be achieved if one becomes good at writing uh, open studio macros or open studio measures. So those are um, done in, in the open, they're actually applied in the open studio application tool, which we'll see next, and also in the parametric analysis tool. Just a few more words about measures. There's a, a collection of measures that exist on a, on, at the, a, a warehouse called the Building Component Library. And those measures are in the public domain. They're free. They're, anybody can have access to them and reuse them. And those measures, again, are very powerful and flexible. Uh, down at the bottom right, you're seeing a measure here that articulates literally the building's form and fabric. It adds stories to a building or it changes the window wall ratio and the, you know, any number of things that can be done through the uh, application of measures. So I like to think of measures as the great enabler because if I uh, use a measure, it's and I understand how it works, I don't have to, uh, I can use it over and over and over again. I don't have to recreate the same logic every time. And that's huge leverage uh, for modelers, for folks like me who do a lot of repetitive work. The final thing about measures is that they can not just alter a model, you know, change the window wall ratio as this measure is doing, but they can also um, change the output of a model in terms of generating reports and they can also perform a QA, a quality assurance or quality control checks against a model. So we'll see some examples. I've written a couple measures for us to look at here a few slides down. So we would migrate in this process. We've now left the SketchUp plugin, the Open Studio SketchUp plugin. We've ported our work for this uh, recreation center to this Open Studio application. And we would now design the HVAC systems uh, for the building. And it's very simple and you'll see at the bottom Right, the Open Studio graphical user interface for uh, configuring baseline HVAC systems. So Open Studio application ships with templates for the ASHRAE 1 through 10, ASHRAE systems 1 through 10, that are essentially drag, drop, and configure uh, baseline HVAC systems. And in this case, we're looking at a, it looks like a system 2, or it's, it's a packaged rooftop unit with a gas-fired coil. So here's a DX compressor, there's a gas-fired furnace, there's a, looks like a, a single, a two fan, I've got a supply fan and a return fan. I don't have any energy recovery, I don't, I may or may not have an economizer. Those are the kind of things we would configure here in Open Studio to be compliant with Appendix G uh, 90.1-2007. So just to be clear on that again, you can't automatically generate a compliant HVAC system, but you can bring in the base system and configure it to be compliant with the watts per CFM that you need or the watts per GPM for a pump and so on and so forth. So uh, another example here of how we would use measures to create that compliant baseline model. Uh, we would use a measure here to add hot water, service hot water to our building. And this is a new feature, just a new feature of Open Studio version 1.4.0, which is the current release, where you can inject a measure real time. Now that sounds kind of complicated. What do I really mean? It really means that I can use these automated scripts, these macros, so to speak, to change my model in real time. Just like executing a macro in Excel, I can use this script, and we'll do this again in a few minutes. The script you see here on the screen at the top left, it's a script for adding service hot water to my model. I have to provide the script with some inputs, the, the fuel type and the consumption or usage. And then uh, Open Studio will create, and you'll see at the bottom right here, the hot water system, the hot water usage objects, and the hot water distribution, the hot water pump, the hot water controls. Everything associated with that will be automatically created. And that would be through scripting. And uh, furthermore, I can take what is created, and you can kind of see it here at the, left, on the right of this uh, pane, and I can configure it. So maybe, it, maybe, for example, it would create a hot water system that is generating 
140 degrees supply water and I want to make it 125. Well, that again is just a configuration issue once the objects have been created. So this is really a neat feature, powerful feature for changing your models in real time uh, using the Open Studio application. And we'll do one of these again in just a few minutes. Just drive home the point, a real time demo. Um, this, uh, the feature is called Apply Measure Now. That's the feature I just described a moment ago where you're applying a measure to your model. You're literally wanting to change something. And that change, the something in that sentence could be anything. You could change set points. You could change equipment. You could change properties of fenestration. You could change, you name it. You could change it real time by applying a measure now. And again, I mentioned that there are approximately 125 public measures that are in the Open Studio um, Building Component Library that are reusable and can be applied in this using this feature. There's also the ability to create your own measures, your own macros, if you will. And what I'm thinking of, the real productivity in this workflow is to sequentially chain these measures together so that you automatically generate what it is you want. So I mentioned a moment ago I would for example, create a measure, execute a measure to add hot water to my model. I might write another measure that would change the temperature set point. And I might another measure that would, say, change the um, usage, gallons per day per person. And I would chain them together sequentially so that when I ran the three together, one, two, three, ran them sequentially, I would end up with what I wanted. And I might have a whole library of different measures to accomplish these things measures for hot water for hotels versus hot water for multifamily buildings versus hot water for office buildings, which are certainly very, very different in terms of their configuration and setup. What I'm describing here is essentially automation. And this is the framework that supports automation through the Open Studio application. So here's an example of a private measure. Um, I mentioned that you can have your own measure. I wrote a measure for this demo. Uh, to apply a tariff that is reasonable and realistic for Pond 1601. As I mentioned a few slides back, the, um, the incentives for 1601 are energy cost savings between your baseline and your uh, proposed model. So we really need to calculate energy cost accurately, and that's not something that's simple to do or trivial to do, but I wrote a measure that would do that, and in my measure I essentially brought in uh, a number of tariffs uh, for Con Ed uh, and both NYSEG, and I present the user with a drop-down menu. They select the tariff, whether in this case it might be Con Ed, SC9, General Large. And then that logic and the, enti the entire logic for that tariff, including the block rates and the, the different breakpoints where the rates change, would be applied to our energy model. And therefore, when I run my energy model, I will get as an output energy cost. And that energy cost will be reflective of the true tariff. So that's just an example, again, of a of someone, in this case myself, writing a custom measure, a private measure, to do something that I just did not want to do manually over and over and over again. I don't want to post-process these things outside of the simulation tool. And that gets me two things. In my case, it gives me a very quick response to the actual predicted energy cost of a model. And it also gives me increased accuracy, because if I'm going to look at some techniques where I'm going to shift energy from different times of day, or maybe I even look at some ice, you know, thermal storage, could be mass storage for that matter, where I'm shifting energy through different times of day. And if the tariff is uh, complex enough to account for that, I want credit for that in my energy cost calculations. So by simply building this measure, I have it now. Until the tariff changes, I can update the tariff itself. On the right, you see an example of this measure. And I mentioned earlier, these are like macros. They're like writing DBA macros. But they're written in uh, a, a language called Ruby. And if you have ever written a macro in Ruby, I'm sorry, in VBA, then you are qualified to write a Ruby script. It is not that much uh, different. It's a scripted language. It's something that you can certainly handle. So in our workflow, moving on here again, we would migrate from the Open Studio application. We've applied a number of measures to get our baseline model uh, defined the way we wanted to. And then we would go to this thing called the parametric analysis tool. This is a third application in the Open Studio ecosystem. It's a separate standalone application, and it's really all about scenario management. So this is where we have something called a seed model or a baseline model, and we're going to load that into PAT with parametric analysis tool, and we're going to build up scenarios that we're going to evaluate against the seed model. 
So um, that's really what Pat's purpose is. It's all about scenario management. One of the very, very powerful features of the um, measure library, the building component measure library, are the, is a set of measures that replicate the ASHRAE AEDGs, or Advanced Energy Design Guides. So some of you may be familiar with these, these guides. These are uh, publicly available. They're free. You'll see screenshots on the left here. They're documents that are several hundred pages in depth and nature. And they are prescriptive guidelines for achieving 50% savings on uh, new construction buildings. And they also are by climate zone and by, uh, of course, by building sector here. These uh, documents have essentially been coded into scripts. And so we have a number of scripts here that take all of this PDF language and put it into the Ruby macros. And they can easily be executed in PAT to see the potential for savings very quickly in a project when they're applied against a 90.1 2007 compliant baseline. So we'll see that again. I'm going to move a little faster so we can actually do some real examples here. But essentially with PAT, we're again leveraging predefined, pre-built measures, measures built by others, measures built by ourselves in our own private library. We're, we're creating those measures and con configuring them. We're grouping them together in what are called design alternatives. This is really important for, again, for PON 1601. We want to appreciate the interactions. That's why we're doing simulation in general. We want to be able to account for the interactions. And finally, we can also account for uh, cost information, lifecycle cost feedback as well, when we apply measures. And then we're going to just simply run the study. The last piece before we get into the, the real demo here is that the, uh, the simulation studies are executed using PAT. PAT can run these um, simulations on every core in your machine. So for example, if you have an eight core machine, you can run seven N-1 simulations simultaneously. Um, PAT also has this ability to uh, communicate with the Amazon cloud, the EC2 cloud, to run hundreds or thousands of simulations simultaneously. And it's not expensive. It's not what you might think when you think about the cost of um, time sitting around waiting for these simulations to complete. It makes a lot of sense to spawn these simulations onto the Amazon cloud and run them in parallel at a, a high performance computing scale. So that's another feature that Open Studio offers that the other engines don't. Output from PAT is basically very simple. You'll see this simple um, summary output for each of our design alternatives. What we care about with PON 1601, we care about peak demand because that's our, de that's our design incentive. We care about electrical savings because that, again, is part of the owner's incentive. And we care about this annual utility cost savings because that's going to tier us into which, um, which bin or which bucket of savings um, for the incentive that we're going to get. So those are very easy to see very easy to see where we fall with those. And we can very easily take those and just post-process those in a spreadsheet, which I did here as an example, um, to determine roughly what's the incentive here on a KWH per square foot um, basis? What kind of incentives are we looking at on this building? Would it actually be possible to run a smaller building, a 3,000, 5,000, 8,000 square foot building through PON 1601 to go through the performance-based path? I think, uh, you know, if it were me and I was doing this, I would write this uh, exact spreadsheet that you're seeing here into another measure just to automate that step as well. And I'm one step closer to pushing a smaller building through PON 1601. So I certainly think it is possible. Uh, let's go ahead and dump over here into the um, live portion of our webinar. We've got 15 minutes left for today. So let's just demonstrate some of the things we went through today. So I'll go ahead and first open up SketchUp. And I will open up, uh, this is SketchUp 8.0, which is the free version of SketchUp. It's, it runs in Ruby 1.8.0. And if you're going to use Open Studio until the next release, I would recommend using this, uh, this version of SketchUp, which again is SketchUp 8.0. So we can go here, the plugins that are available within SketchUp, we can just go ahead and open up. Actually, first I'll go ahead and open up a SketchUp file that I've saved. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, let's open up. I sort of V1. You'll see what happens here is that um, I simply brought in an image of my drawing, like I mentioned in the slides. I scaled the image to size, and I started using SketchUp drawing tools to create and break out the uh, plan view of this building into different space types. So that's all this really is. 
I'm going to go ahead and open up an Open Studio model, which was created on top of this from the extrusions coming up. We'll go ahead and open that model as version 15. Uh, let's, take, let's take that one. Now this might take a bit to run because I, I apologize if you're seeing some jerkiness. We are running on a virtual machine um, server that I'm running on and the web meeting as well. So I'll try to make sure I slow down here. But you should see in front of you um, a 3D representation of this building here in SketchUp. And again, it's fully built out. Uh, when I'm using the SketchUp plugin, I have full access to all of SketchUp's tools, including section cuts, um, any of the other uh, SketchUp functions that are available. And I showed you earlier the Open Studio Object Inspector, and that is uh, can be launched through a number of different. Here I'm launching it through the menu. We can see this inspector tool, which when I peek, when I select something in my model, I'm just going to select this window here. I'm going to go into the space, and I'll literally pick that window. And you'll see I've selected the subsurface, it's subsurface 55, and it's telling you that that's a fixed window without a construction name. And that doesn't mean that it doesn't have a construction name. That means it's inheriting it from something above. You know, it's not, this is a, what we're looking at here is Open Studio's inheritance object model. And the fact that it doesn't have a name here means it's inheriting it from somewhere else. So something we cover in training again, because it's very critical to understand that I could, of course, assign something, assign a window to this, and I would be overriding that inheritance. So that's how this object model works. Now let's go ahead and do that. I'll assign an exterior uh, model for climate zone for A. That's fine. Okay. So from the Open Studio SketchUp plugin, I can launch the Open Studio application. And the two applications here, again, there are two, these are the first two we started talking about, they are linked together. And what you'll see here in just a moment is another tool that will open up. Here we are, the Open Studio application. And uh, we, are, we are again sharing an object model between the two. It takes a moment here for this data to, to load up. Um, should be coming in momentarily. All of these tools are free. I think I didn't mention that, but everything that I've shown so far has been a, a free tool. And looks like, oh, I know why I got that. No problem. I just need to get a weather file in here. So let's go ahead and I'll need to reload that. Pardon me for a moment. File, open up my Open Studio model. And I'll take that. Okay. Um, so there are, needless to say, there are a lot of tricks to using this tool. It is not very well documented in terms of user support. It is extremely powerful. It's extremely uh, capable of being leveraged for scale, but it's not well documented. So some of the things we cover in our, our trainings, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, are these little tricks and tips that you'll see me doing here and then. Uh, there are certainly some little things that you need to know if you're using Open Studio, that they're very hard to learn any other way. So I'm going to go ahead again here and launch the Open Studio application. Wait for that to open up. And that should bring in again our 2300 square foot. Oh, that's okay. That's, I think that, there we go. 2300 square foot recreation center. And what we'll do with this is we'll go ahead and, and examine the model and we'll run a measure just so you can see that the measure, uh, run measure now feature. It's something I want to show you to make sure that you understand how it works and why it would be a, a really powerful feature to use for building models. So while I'm waiting for that to load, think of it again as just uh, automating your, um, just like you would any other type of, of action in Excel when you write a script. I'm going to load a weather file here for Chicago. I wrote a uh, design day weather file. And then I'm going to go to this thing called components and measure, apply measure now. So when I do this, the Open Studio application, which is essentially, again, it's an interface on Energy Plus, is going to show me what measures do I have in my model right now. And I'm going to go ahead and do that service hot water measure that we talked about. Should be in here. Uh, maybe I'll do something different. How about 
HVAC controls. So just thermostat set points by degree. Sure. Okay. So here again, if we read carefully, this measure was designed to change all of the schedules, not just any particular one. Let's remember, I have three thermal zones in this model. So if I wanted to have only change one thermal zone, I'd have to make a copy of this measure and change it. I'm going to go ahead and write this uh, changing by three degrees, and I will leave my design date thermostats. I will apply the measure. And what's happening here again is Open Studio is executing the script. It's running the measure. It's going to give me some feedback as far as what it actually did. And then it's going to ask me if I want to save the model. Now these measures again, so you can see initial set points, my cooling set point was 32 Fahrenheit. Wow, so that was really bad. 286, initial heating set point from 32. Oh, I have an unconditioned zone in the model to 70. So okay, it did adjust the 32 or the this is the unconditioned, there's no HVAC system on that guy. So you can again see that I uh, did adjust my set points the way the measure thought it would, and it will ask me, you know, are you sure you want to accept this or do you want to cancel out? I'll go ahead and accept it. The OpenStay application, while we're here, I'll just do a quick energy simulation uh, run, and then we'll go over into PAT and we'll add some of the AEDG measures. So the application itself it is an interface on top of Energy Plus, and there's lots of little switches inside the Energy Plus model that can be manipulated to make the model run faster, or slower, or perhaps more detail, less detail, so on and so forth. That's the kind of stuff, again, we do cover in the uh, Open Studio training courses. There's really, gosh, there's no one way to do this. It really depends on the workflow that you're trying to achieve. And again, I've tried to make this webinar follow a, the workflow that one might use for a NYSERDA 1601, but for an existing building, for a calibration scenario and so forth, completely different workflow. You'll see here again in the Open Studio application, I'm not going to do it for NYSERDA Pond 1601, but you can put in utility bills and you can perform calibration with Open Studio. I'm going to go ahead and set some settings so that this, it's a one hour time step that will allow our simulation to uh, run a little faster. I'm going to change some calculation settings. To, okay, that should work. So let's go ahead and just do a quick run to make sure the simulation will execute. And then we'll go over to the parametric analysis tool and we'll build a quick simulation study. So it looks like this is trying to execute at 12% through. I'm gonna, I'll get feedback in this feedback pane. If it, if it halts, it's making it. Looks good so far. It's just good practice to make sure that um, before you move over to the parametric analysis tool that you can get the simulation to execute in the Open Studio application. You can see here I did run the, the measure. It picked Con Ed's SC9 large, general large for electric tariff and the firm gas tariff. So those are oh, and I failed. So let's see why I failed. Let's look quickly to see why the model failed. That should be fairly easy. I'm not sure if I'm going to have time to debug this on the fly. We can look. Okay. Well, to keep this moving, let's go back and look at that measure. I will show you that measure and just show you how it works. This is the measure I wrote for an ISERTA Pond 1601 energy costs. I exposed a drop-down list of four different um, tariffs that could be one could select from, and then I again that's for electricity and that's for gas. And it's that simple. Anytime I want to apply these tariffs, I could just simply apply this measure into my model, and that would work. Uh, unless the tariff changes, I go back and update the Ruby code. Otherwise, that would be the measure that I would, would get. So let's now go ahead and launch the parametric analysis tool so we can show that piece of it. And the parametric analysis tool, again, a third application. I'm going to go ahead and open a project that it was, uh, let's see, test two. Open this up so we can see it. We've got about five minutes left in this webinar, so I'm going to open some stuff that's already been run so you can see the answers or see the results. The purpose of PAT, again, is, is basically a simulation study. You, you would never want to run PAT unless you knew why you were going to run it. You have to have a goal. You have to have a reason. And in this case, my reasoning was to explore three different AEDGs. I was going to explore uh, water source heat pumps, air source heat pumps, and ground source heat pumps as HVAC uh, options for this 2,300 square foot building. So let's see what we've got here. 
actually it looks like in here I have insulation. So this is a different design. So it looks like I created some measures here. R value of insulation for walls, R value of insulation for roofs, and window to wall ratios by facade group. And it looks like I went ahead and took those measures and I grouped those together into design alternatives and I ran this locally. So you'll see here I have uh, 45 different design alternatives that I have. I'm going to go ahead and start to run locally. We'll see if it finishes and I'll go back to the slides. We'll see um, if that will run. So the purpose again, and, and it's hard to show in an hour because there just isn't enough time to go through all of this, but as part of our training we do walk our students through the entire process here. You're getting an, a crash course uh, in Opus 3 application, the, the SketchUp plugin, and parametric analysis tool. So I've just executed again um, 45 simulations. I've done it locally on my machine. This machine has 24 processors, so it shouldn't take too awful long to run. Let's go back to the slides here while that's running. I just want to make a summary and sort of close out before we go back and, and check on the model uh, simulation running. A few takeaways from this presentation. One is that I think it is possible. I think that it certainly is possible for us to run smaller buildings uh, through workflows like NYSERDA PON1601, simulation-based workflows that take into account the interactions and measures and so forth. I think that's definitely possible to do. And, though, and the way we're going to do that really is by automating tasks. The automating, if we catch ourselves doing something twice, three times, four times, we say, does it make sense to write a measure to automate that? And that's certainly possible to do. It's all available. The framework is here to do it. The tools are available to do it. It's all free and available. The piece that's missing in all of this is really uh, the knowledge on how to use it. So to really use this stuff efficiently, the, the closer on this would be that consider investing in some training uh, for the Open Studio ecosystem. Because I think without the training, you're going to spend a lot of time um, you're going to spend the time one way or the other, let's put it that way, and the, the, the training is a very, very valuable investment in learning how to use the tools efficiently and quickly. And so, just like this webinar we have here, this is PSD's webinar schedule coming up next week on July 22nd. I hope you guys can attend. We'll, we'll have a, an hour-long webinar on new features with Open Studio version 1.4. We'll cover some of these um, same topics that we covered today. We also have a free webinar on uh, schedule for August 14th. Uh, that's a very short one again, but again, a sneak peek into the capabilities of Open Studio. And in terms of training, there is a New York State pond that uh, we're so lucky to have and I started co-funding the training uh, funds for these training sessions. The top three here, September 15th, October 8th, and October 16th. If you are uh, happen to be uh, qualified under the New York uh, Systems Benefits Charge, you can get a 50% subsidy on these trainings. They're, they're two-day trainings for using Open Studio. And we will cover all of these tools, not just the SketchUp plugin, not just the application, but also the parametric analysis tool. And that's two days of intensive work here in New York City, Binghamton, and Syracuse. So consider those classes if you're interested in learning how to really harness this ecosystem. You can find out more about the uh, prices and the course curriculums and so forth on our website at psdconsulting.com slash training slash New York State trainings. And that's really the end of our webinar. I'm going to go back here uh, and see where we ended up with our simulations uh, to share that with you. But that's all I have prepared for today. Let's see. It, just, it looks like we're still running a block of 24 simulations here. So it's going to take a bit uh, for these guys to finish through. And um, I'm going to go ahead and close for today. And I hope to see you guys at our upcoming training. I do hope to see, uh, to work with you. I deeply believe that this ecosystem that DOE is invested in, that NREL is building out, and that practitioners are just now getting a sense of how it might be leveraged to make their work more efficient. I deeply believe there's a lot of opportunity here, so I do hope to see you in the future. So thank you very much for attending today, and we will be uh, seeing you soon, if not at, at future free webinars, hopefully at, at training events. Have a great day. Bye-bye.